Our guest tonight uh, is known to many of you. He's uh, extraordinarily well published. Uh, his articles have appeared over the decades in Foreign Affairs Quarterly and other distinguished uh, journals. Uh, he's the author of uh, over 40 articles on the questions of the Cold War era. Uh, he's written seven or eight books on the topic. To let me read some of the uh, titles of the books, which gives you, I think, a brief encapsulation of his, his interests. I promise not to bore him with his, his four-page resume, and I won't. But um, I think the titles of his work very clearly suggest his range of interests. Uh, the United States and the Origins of the Cold War, 41 to 47, published as a young scholar in 1972. And I should note in the way of uh, approval of the academic community, he was awarded in 1973 the Bancroft Prize, the National Historical Society Prize, and the Stuart L. Burneth Prize, given by the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, all in consequence of that first uh, very notable work. Russia, the Soviet Union, and the United States, an interpretive history. Strategies of containment, a critical appraisal of post-war American national security policy. The long peace, inquiries into history, uh, the history of the Cold War. The United States and the End of the Cold War, Reconsiderations, Implications, Provocations. And more recently, as a co-editor, Containment, Documents on American Foreign Policy and Strategy, 45 to 50, and Containment, Concept, and Policy. His, he's currently working on three areas of, 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 I think, enormous interest. First of all, Rethinking the Cold War. Secondly, George Kennan and American Foreign Policy, and he will uh, sometime in the, the future uh, publish the definitive biography of George Kennan, uh, that great American statesman, matched only perhaps by John Quincy Adams, a, a task which every historian uh, must envy. And then thirdly, the whole question of contemporary American history. Not surprisingly, uh, his awards and grants and fellowship are, are striking. Most recently, uh, last year at least, he was Harmsworth Professor at Queens College, Oxford University, and he holds the Whitney Shepherdson Fellowship at the Council on Foreign Relations this year. He's been a not only a member of the Academy, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, He's been on the advisory committee, at least the historical advisory committee of the CIA. It, nothing to do with counterintelligence at all. Um, he served as uh, uh, on the Council on Foreign Relations a Pew Foundation Task Force on American Security in a Changing World. He served as president, as well as a longtime member of the Society for historians of American foreign relations. And he has served on the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars Project of, international of the International History of the Cold War. Those are merely suggestions of the scope uh, of his career and the high esteem in which he is held by his, the professional academic community. This should be an extraordinarily interesting evening. It's my enormous pleasure to present Professor John Lewis Gattis. President Byrd, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Relations, it's indeed a pleasure to be here particularly since given the way the weather looked this morning and last night, I wasn't at all sure that I could indeed be here. Frank has given you a very long, uh, embarrassingly long list of um, uh, credentials. I will only add to what he said that when that first book indeed won the Bancroft Prize, I went for the first time shortly after that to lecture at Newport at the Naval War College. Uh, 
and was reasonably pleased with the well-balanced and well-rounded lecture I had given, but was following, on walking out of the auditorium, following a couple of big, beefy Marines, one of whom turned to the other rather loudly and said, who is this guy Bancroft in the first place, and why does he give prizes to communists? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the events of the past few years, I'm afraid, have been disillusioning in the extreme. For anyone who thought that the end of the Cold War would allow the angelic nature of mankind, at least to finally to manifest itself in the conduct of world affairs. As you know, the international community has so far failed most miserably to settle a brutal civil war in former Yugoslavia. One made all the more appalling by the revelation that it is still possible for Europeans to want to kill other Europeans. Violence uh, reminiscent of fascism appears on the rise elsewhere in Europe even as European leaders avert their eyes from it. The Marxist-Leninist world has found as much pain as exhilaration in the transition to freedom, democracy, and capitalism. It is indeed a sad thing when Democrats have to use tanks to break up a democratically selected parliament, or when free elections produce majorities for those who would cheerfully abolish free elections. Meanwhile, large portions of what we used to call the third world continue to sink more deeply into conditions of overpopulation, undernourishment, and the resulting predictable discontent. Situations like those in Somalia and Haiti, I'm afraid, are likely to be in many ways the future that lies before us. The one remaining superpower, the United States, seems only a shadow of its former self, having demonstrated not only uncertainty over where it wants to lead the rest of the world, there is really nothing new in that, but uncertainty also over whether it wants to continue to lead the rest of the world. And that, for many allies of the United States, and perhaps for some erstwhile adversaries as well, that may be the most unsettling thing of all. Now, in fact, of course, this is an excessively gloomy picture. The situation is not all that bad. We shouldn't let our disappointment over the fact that the end of the Cold War did not change human nature cause us to lose sight of the very real accomplishments that we have achieved over the past five years. To take a more optimistic view, one can argue that what we've done is to build the most promising basis for a peaceful and equitable international order over these last five years than we've had at any other point in this century. After all, the threat of a superpower nuclear war no longer looms over us. And although the danger of nuclear use has by no means gone away, the scale of the worst case catastrophe that this could now involve is so much smaller than the best case results of what a Soviet American nuclear war would have been that it pales by comparison. Indeed, the prospect of any great power war breaking out for any reason is sufficiently remote as to be almost unthinkable these days. Regional and civil wars uh, are no less dreadful for those who have to endure them, uh, but they are distinctly preferable to world wars, as I think everyone would acknowledge. Democracy and capitalism have spread more widely than ever before. Communications link distant regions more closely than would have been conceivable even a few years ago. And even allowing for situations such as those in former Yugoslavia, Somalia, and Haiti, I think it is probably fair to say that human rights on a global basis are more widely respected now than they have ever been. Nor, I would add, is it written anywhere on tablets of stone with lightning bolts that Americans always have to lead in every situation. So before we get too depressed about the current state of world affairs, I think we ought to ask the question, would we like to have the Cold War, or indeed any other period in the modern history of international relations, back again? I think what we've achieved is by no means perfect, but it is progress, and we ought not to lose sight of that fact. Still, though, to acknowledge progress does not relieve us of the obligation to examine our current difficulties and to try to devise means for alleviating it's really not enough simply to stumble from crisis to crisis, relieved that the Cold War is over, but disappointed at how disorderly the outcome of the Cold War is turning out to be.
seems to me we need some kind of analytical framework within which to try to understand these events. Only then, one would think, could a coherent strategy for dealing with those events actually emerge. It's not that it's totally impossible to achieve such a framework. We had one with the concept of containment uh, during the Cold War, a concept whose fundamental assumptions and anticipated results have now been amply vindicated. We have no equivalent geopolitical vision, however, for the post-Cold War world. And it seems to me it's high time we came up with one. It is, in effect, 1947 all over again. Now, I can't promise you such a concept here tonight. But I would at least like to try to advance the process a little bit by suggesting what we might call a preliminary diagnosis of our current situation. It seems to me that one of the causes of our current post-Cold War malaise may well lie in a tendency to accord praiseworthy ideas, excessive deference. Now, philosophers since Plato have known very well of the gap that exists between principles and reality and the practice of statecraft ever since, to say nothing of the conduct of life itself, has revolved around the need to bridge that gap between principles and reality. The history of the Soviet Union, and indeed of the entire Marxist world, reflected very well the practical difficulties that can arise from the excessively literal application of abstract principles. Nor have the Western democracies entirely avoided these difficulties themselves uh, during the course of this century. Somehow, though, I think the abruptness with which the Cold War ended, together with the astonishingly peaceful manner in which that happened, gave rise to the curious notion that ideas had somehow triumphed over history, which is, after all, the messy process by which ideas get put into imperfect practice. I think it should have been a hint of trouble ahead that the intellectual community took as seriously as it did uh, Francis Fukuyama's odd little article from the summer of 1989, which you may remember, called The End of History. Because if that rather strange literary effort implied anything at all, it was that we had somehow reached the stage at which concepts like democracy and capitalism could be literally implemented, and therefore that the process of history by which Fukuyama meant the compromises that have to be made in translating ideas into reality the processes of history had come to an end. Well, of course, it didn't quite turn out that way, but I think Fukuyama's article did anticipate a kind of thinking that became fairly widespread over the next several years in the early 1990s. After all, most Westerners had assumed that the Soviet Union would fight to the death, and perhaps to the death of everybody else as well, before it would allow its empire in Eastern Europe to collapse, or Germany to reunify, or its own status as a state to pass into history. When all of these things did happen with virtually no blood shed, it seems to me a kind of euphoria set in based on the belief that we had somehow entered a new era in which the gap between stating principles and put the, putting them into practice had been significantly narrowed. It seems to me this post-Cold War euphoria took a couple of forms. In the political realm, it encouraged the belief that the old liberal vision of a world in which people could choose their own forms of government was not only desirable as a basis on which to build a new international order, uh, but was practical. It was a good thing in principle, and it could be achieved in practice as well. An intensified commitment to this principle of self-determination, it was argued, would produce a more peaceful world with greater respect for human rights than had been the case during the Cold War, or for that matter, in all of the international systems that had preceded the Cold War. In the economic realm, it seems to me post-Cold War euphoria celebrated the apparent vindication of market capitalism, the absence of which had undermined Marxist regimes throughout the world. And this idea, too, was rooted in the liberal tradition. Unlike the principle of self-determination, though its plausibility had actually been fairly specifically demonstrated through the creation in the post-World War II era of a tripartite economic relationship between the United States, Western Europe, and Japan that had significantly reduced barriers to international trade and investment over the past several decades and had thereby produced, or so it was argued, uh, unparalleled material prosperity. <clears throat> 
Given the eagerness with which the citizens of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe seemed to want to have these benefits of capitalism extended to them, it was, I think, only natural to come to see global economic integration as well, as something that was not only admirable in principle, but actually achievable in practice. Accordingly, although more by emotion than by calculation, the triumphant Western democracies fell into a kind of pattern in the early 1990s of regarding political self-determination and economic integration no longer as distant goals, but rather as priorities for immediate action. You could see this in the shift in attitudes that took place toward the breakup of the Soviet Union. The initial view, you'll remember, had been that only the Baltic states and perhaps Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia would constitute viable sovereignties. Uh, but after the August 1991 coup in Moscow, the West reconciled itself almost at once to the independence and the official recognition as well of the Ukraine and Belarus and by the end of 1991 to all of the remaining non-Russian republics. And meanwhile, the reunification of Germany and the prospect of having to deal with an expansion of capitalism into Eastern Europe accelerated the movement toward economic integration that was already well underway within the European community, with the result that the Maastricht Treaty was signed in December 1991, the same month in which the Soviet Union at last fell apart. The year 1992, it was widely expected would be a kind of annus uh, mirabilis, a miracle year in which the new world order based on the principles of political self-determination and economic integration would finally emerge. Instead, I think it is no exaggeration to say, paraphrasing Queen Elizabeth after Charles and Diana had broken up and Windsor Castle had burned down, that 1992 turned out to be a, a, an annus horribilis for both of these principles, and 1993 was not much better. Having witnessed how peacefully the Soviet Union had disintegrated, the international community almost automatically, even absent-mindedly, extended diplomatic recognition to the constituent republics of Yugoslavia, despite clear evidence that the breakup of that country was not going to proceed with anything like the ease or the relative peacefulness with which the former Soviet Union had ceased to exist. As a consequence, the international community soon had a bloody three-way civil war on its hands in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and still does, with no idea, really, of how to resolve it. And similarly, although fortunately at far less human cost, the architects of Maastricht found themselves unexpectedly in trouble with their own citizens as they attempted to explain the lengthy and complicated document that they had negotiated uh, and signed. And despite the fact that the Maastricht Treaty has now gone into effect, the vision of an integrated European economy with a common currency and with no barriers uh, to flows of commerce, labor, and capital now looks uh, almost as distant as ever, quite a difference from what 1992 was indeed supposed to represent. At the same time, as we all know, protectionist pressures have been on the rise in the country that did the most of all to create an open world. Uh, economy during the preceding half century, the United States itself. So neither political self-determination nor economic integration, it appeared, were going to be as easy to accomplish as the prophets of the New World Order had expected, to say nothing of those who believed that history had come to an end. So I think it's worth asking the question, what's going on here? How was it that so many high hopes were dashed so quickly? How had so many bright people underestimated the difficulties they would confront in seeking so literal an implementation of ideas which, while praiseworthy in principle, had hitherto had very little practical application? Well, I think part of the problem, obviously, was just plain old wishful thinking. Uh, the end of the Cold War had forced a suspension of belief in some of the most fundamental assumptions upon which our understanding of international relations had rested uh, for the past half century or so, and so it ought not to have been too surprising that an equivalent suspension of belief in the existence of practical difficulties regarding integration and self-determination should have arisen. But I think that's only an immediate explanation for what happened. Uh, a, more deep, a deeper and more serious cause, I suspect, may well lie in our failure to establish whether the principles of political self-determination and economic integration uh, 
are indeed always and in every situation compatible with one another. Just because ideals share the quality of being admirable does not mean that they will always complement one another when they're put into practice. The ideals of political self-determination and economic integration, when you first look at them, do not seem to be contradictory. Were not both of them, for example, rooted firmly in the American Federal Constitution of 1787, which sought to secure individual rights within a kind of common market? Did they not form the basis of the liberal political tradition and economic tradition in Britain during much of the 19th century with its emphasis on representative government and free trade? Was it not Woodrow Wilson himself who most explicitly linked political self-determination with economic integration in the famous 14 points speech in 1918, a linkage that Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill then reaffirmed in the Atlantic Charter of 1941? And indeed, was not the whole idea of the Marshall Plan and NATO one of simultaneously containing the Soviet Union while rehabilitating Europe, thereby achieving the twin goals of democracy and prosperity at the same time? It's not at all clear from a conventional historical perspective that these two principles of political self-determination and economic integration do in fact conflict with one another. And of course, if that's the case, then we can simply chalk up our current difficulties perhaps a combination of bad luck and occasional mismanagement, and look to the future with a, an optimism worthy of Fukuyama. But of course, the problem with historians, one of the things that is really irritating about historians is that they don't all read history in the same way. Now, there are other ways to look at our experiences with self-determination and integration that are not quite so encouraging. Consider the American Revolution itself in which the colonists found their right to determine their own political future at odds with their economic interests, which were to remain within the British Empire. Consider how much self-determination the expansion of capitalism during the 19th century actually allowed. I think Marx did have some valid basis, after all, for complaining about the effects of industrialization upon human liberty. Consider the difficulties that arose in Eastern and Central Europe after World War I in attempting to implement Wilson's vision of a simultaneously democratic and prosperous world. It became all too clear as the boundaries were drawn at the Paris Peace Conference, redrawn actually, uh, and afterwards that economic and political logic did not always correspond. And consider how delicate a compromise the Atlantic Charter of 1941 actually was because of the tension that lay beneath the surface of Anglo-American relations over the future of the British Empire and how the principle of self-determination was going to affect it. And then consider how far the Cold War world really was from reflecting Woodrow Wilson's vision. I think it may well tell us something about the contradictions inherent in the ideas of political self-determination and economic integration, that the Cold War geopolitical settlement uh, of 1945 and after, which if you think about it, wound up insulating about one third of the world from the workings of both of these principles, that that Cold War geopolitical settlement wound up lasting more than twice as long as the one that Woodrow Wilson so carefully sought to craft uh, after World War I. So, who knows? We may well be in the presence here on the one hand, simply of a disagreement among historians, in which case we can all relax and watch the footnotes fly. Or it could be more serious than that. We could be in the presence of one of those fundamental fault lines in human history, a deep zone of strain that has existed for a long time without our noticing it, perhaps because other more striking features of the geopolitical landscape covered it up. Things like a Great Depression or two world wars or the Cold War. But as these features have eroded away, the underlying tectonic configurations of the landscape have become clearer, and the tremors that routinely take place along this integration, disintegration, uh, 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 self-determination integration fault line have become more difficult to ignore. We would, by this logic, simply be getting back to normal but normality in this instance would be a little more like living along the San Andreas Fault than the shores of Chesapeake Bay, a somewhat unsettling kind of normality. Well, precisely what is it, though, if you push this argument further, what is it 
about political self-determination and economic integration that is or may be uh, contradictory. Well, the proverbial woman from Mars looking at this subject uh, for the first time uh, might well point out that the principle of political self-determination would appear to call for breaking up large concentrations of power, like the British Empire for the Americans in 1776, or like the Soviet Union and its empire for those who were subjected to it in 1989-91, uh, thereby bringing the control of government and politics closer to home. Democracy works, in other words, uh, through the diffusion of power uh, by shifting it from the few to the many. But the principle of economic integration, of course, would appear to require individuals and even states to relinquish power by shifting it uh, insofar as it involves shifting uh, it so that uh, they relinquish the right to control their own economic lives. After all, under economic integration, people are supposed to give up the authority to set prices, to divide markets, to determine interest rates, to establish tariffs, and to regulate working conditions, because all of these things are supposed to be assigned to the international forces, uh, to the forces of the international market, or to international institutions, or to Adam Smith's invisible hand, or failing all of those to some international hegemon capable of providing the order the world economy requires if it is to function. Prosperity occurs under this model, or so it is claimed, when power is shifted from the many to the few. Now, obviously, this is all grossly oversimplified. Martians like most people uh, who are outsiders, tend not to be aware of the subtleties and the nuances that complicate life. And certainly it would be difficult to sustain the argument that political self-determination and economic integration are contradictory in all aspects. After all, the prosperity that comes from economic integration, for example, may well encourage democracy. That form of government doesn't very easily coexist with chronic poverty. It may also be that a certain amount of democracy is required if an entrepreneurial spirit uh, is to arise uh, in a post-industrial age. Innovation does not flourish particularly well in rigid, hierarchically organized systems. Economists would insist that the very genius of market capitalism is that it diffuses power among millions of producers and consumers. Political scientists would point out that self-determination increases the number if not always the influence of sovereign states. But push the logic of this a little further along for a moment. Isn't it also true, if you think about it, that an uncompromising commitment uh, to self-determination would produce anarchy by producing several thousand sovereignties, rather, what like, uh, rather like what Democratic Party conventions used to be back in the 1970s? Isn't it also true that an uncompromising commitment to economic integration would produce absurdity by leaving states with no authority at all over the conditions in which their own citizens live so that we would all move back to a kind of Calvin Coolidge model of government in which most public officials are asleep most of the time. <laughs> there is, if you think about it in these terms, there is, it would seem, a kind of optimum point short of anarchy and absurdity with respect to how far one can apply each of these principles. And I really wonder if much of the difficulty that we've run into in the post-Cold War era doesn't result from the fact that we have yet to find just what that optimum point actually is. Now, certainly, the principle of political self-determination has not been applied uh, consistently over history for any length of time. After all, after a brief period of experimentation with it in this country in the form of the Articles of Confederation, the United States adopted a federal constitution that created a republic, not a democracy, with the right of the people to control their own government carefully restricted within it. I think the true American attitude toward self-determination became clear in 1861-65, when the United States shed more blood than in all of its other wars combined to deny the right of self-determination to a portion of its own citizenry. Woodrow Wilson's endorsement of self-determination during World War I was motivated, historians will tell you, as much by the immediate desire to undermine Germany's ally, the multinational Austro-Hungarian Empire, and by the need to counter the ideological appeal of the Bolshevik Revolution, as by any belief on Wilson's part that it could be literally implemented. 
We know that Wilson quickly compromised to meet the demands of allies and to ensure the viability of the new states that were being created in East Central Europe. Even though this meant leaving that part of the world, as we still know today, full of disgruntled people whose hopes for political autonomy had been raised but not fulfilled. Much the same thing happened in Asia and the Middle East, where Wilson's rhetoric set off waves of nationalist expectations, ranging from those of the Jews and the Arabs in Palestine uh, to those of Ho Chi Minh in Indochina, none of which Wilson had any serious intention of trying to honor or to meet. Despite Roosevelt and Churchill's commitment to self-determination in the Atlantic Charter, the settlement of World War II wound up being based on the wholesale denial of the right of self-determination. After all, nobody gave the unfortunate people of Eastern Europe an opportunity to vote on whether they would be included within the Soviet sphere of influence. And although American influence was extended for the most part with the consent of those who became subject to it, no votes were taken either on such arrangements as the partition of Germany or Korea or Indochina, or even China itself, if you count as I think you should, Taiwan as part of that country. Self-determination was hardly the animating principle of either superpower's policies during the Cold War, and yet that conflict gave rise to a remarkably stable and long-lasting international order. I think that fact alone perhaps ought to cause us to give pause before we too readily assume that there is a direct relationship between democracy on the one hand and international stability on the other. So just what is the nature of that relationship? I think Woodrow Wilson would have argued, and may even have believed, that if people are free to choose their own forms of government, they will have little reason to want to overthrow their own or anybody else's government, and that the causes of war and revolution will therefore drop away. I think there are several difficulties with that proposition. First of all, what is the particular identity that justifies having a state in the first place? Nobody would take the idea of self-determination so far as to extend sovereignty down to the level of every individual. That's anarchy. But the concept clearly does not confine itself either at the other end of the spectrum, uh, only to those states that already exist, because otherwise one could never have justified recognizing the successor states to Austria-Hungary, or the Russian Empire, or the Ottoman Empire after World War I, or for that matter, recognizing the successor states to the former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia today. None of the possible bases for state identity, language, religion, ethnicity, geography, ideology, none of these command universal assent, as the history of places like Palestine, Tibet, Cyprus, Northern Ireland, and even Quebec amply testify. No sooner had the former Soviet republics proclaimed their own independence in 1991 than challenges arose to them from uh, groups within the borders of those newly created states. Look at what happened recently inside Georgia. Groups that would never have entertained seriously the notion of having their own state as long as a super state like the old Soviet Union ruled over them. As Wilson discovered after World War I, the very proclamation of the principle of self-determination uh, can create new expressions of national consciousness even as it legitimizes the expression of older ones. And it's not at all clear where the process stops once you get it started. Well, if identity provides no universally applicable basis for statehood, what about another criteria, viability? One thing that has limited the practice of self-determination in the past has been concern that the new state would lack the capacity to defend itself or to sustain its own population. But today, the international community rather frowns on the idea that new states should fortify themselves against attack or wall themselves off from international markets. The issue of viability, which once constrained the making of states, therefore carries a lot less weight these days. Uh, and yet the international recognition of Bosnia-Herzegovina provides a tragic example of what can happen when these old criteria of viability are simply swept aside. What is likely to be the relationship of the new state to its neighbors? Is it not unrealistic to expect that the creation of such states will sweep away old antagonisms? What is the basis, after all, for the belief that if people have the right to choose, they will always choose peace? What is to prevent a people from deciding, by perfectly democratic means, that they hate 
rather than love their neighbors and want to cleanse their surroundings of them. Aggression and civil violence, I think it's worth underlining, are not always instigated in all situations by authoritarian leaders. Under certain situations, they can arise quite spontaneously and quite democratically from the people. And the creation of a new state, especially if it involves displacing the citizens of an old state, can very much encourage those tendencies. How does the new state fit within the international community, of which it's a part? What happens in the wider world obviously affects the security of individual states, but what if the formation of new states unsettles previously stable arrangements in world politics? It's not at all clear to me that a proliferation of sovereignties provides any guarantee of a more stable and orderly world as a whole. Uh, just the opposite, I suspect. In the absence of empires, and with the decline of superpowers. However, who is there out there to speak for the, inter the interests of the international system as a whole? Boutros Boutros Ghali, I'm sure, is a fine man, but I'm just not quite sure that he or his organization are up to that task. I think we've given insufficient attention to the question of how far the principle of self-determination should proceed in the post-Cold War world, or to what the alternatives might be if we should decide that it's gone too far. We've tended, rather unthinkingly, to equate self-determination with peace and order, and we failed to recognize, or at least to recall from the lessons of the past, just how much violence and disorder an excessively literal application of the principle of self-determination can bring about. I think we need, in short, to return self-determination to its historical context, which means recognizing that it is a contingent and not an absolute principle, that it will not work for all people in all situations and that some compromises, perhaps many compromises, may have to be made in applying it. Well, what about the other principle I was talking about, economic integration? The fundamental premise here, of course, goes back to Adam Smith and David Ricardo, Ricardo that if uh, barriers to flows of commerce and investment are removed, each nation will concentrate on producing what it makes best and all will benefit accordingly. Attempts to manage the exchange of goods and services, whether through mercantilism or protectionism or other less overt means, it's argued, only perpetuate inefficiencies. The wider and the more open the marketplace, the more efficiently the economy operates. So the theory goes. As in the case of self-determination, though, I think there's some reason to question whether this theory, these principles, really work that way in practice for several reasons. First of all, our historic experience with economic integration really is a lot more limited than most people realize. There never has been a true free trade regime in which commodities, capital, and labor crossed international boundaries with no restrictions at all. Probably the closest that the world has come to an economic integration that linked sovereign states were the systems of relative free trade that were presided over by Great Britain throughout most of the 19th century and by the United States in the decade that followed World War II. The European Union today claims to seek economic integration in the absence of a dominant hegemon, uh, but its membership is much more restricted than, was the, than were that, uh, the, uh, the earlier British and American hegemonic systems, and it's hardly a relationship among equals, it seems to me, as the behavior of the Bundesbank has made relatively clear. The belief, therefore, that all nations will prosper to the same extent equally from economic integration, it seems to me, remains unconfirmed. And then until quite recently, problems of transportation and communication precluded the development of global markets in any event. Distance, uh, until very recently, imposed a kind of compartmentalization that limited the extent to which economies could integrate even if the governments under whose authority they operated would have been willing for them to integrate. It's only really within the past couple of decades that reductions in the cost of shipping commodities and even more striking uh, reductions in the costs of transmitting information have made possible markets that are truly worldwide for an impressive range of goods and services, to say nothing of finance and to say nothing especially of currency speculation. But this is a very different environment from the one, the very limited environment that Adam Smith formulated his ideas in, and it's not at all clear how well we should expect Adam Smith's ideas to work in this much wider world. When inefficient enterprises failed in the old world that Adam Smith 
new in the old system of regional markets. Those who worked in them could either shift to other occupations at home or seek opportunities abroad. An 18th century English sheep herder thrown off land that had been enclosed to improve agricultural productivity had some options. He could go to work in a nearby coal mine or in one of the new factories that coal-fired steam power was making possible in Britain. And there was also the option of emigrating to the United States or to other relatively unpopulated regions where nonetheless the language and the culture were similar and where the demands for labor were insatiable. But with today's multinational corporations, uh, the opening of a new factory in Mexico or in China can cause workers in Liverpool or in Akron to lose their jobs. Differences in language and culture impose very few barriers to switching investments back and forth around the world as needed to maximize profits. But switching workers to wherever these new jobs may be, or even retraining workers for alternative jobs at home is another matter entirely. And this is a new phenomenon in history. Both immigration and re-education these days, as it was not the case in the past, are likely to require cultural transformations of one kind or another, something that was not true in the early days, earlier days when smaller and less integrated markets existed. The trend toward global economic integration, therefore, is generating social pressures that are not going to be easily relieved. Displaced workers continue to look to their governments either for new jobs or for unemployment relief. But when the country itself is losing out to more competitive economies elsewhere, the resources available to provide those benefits dwindle accordingly. There is as yet no global social safety net, as the people of the former Soviet Union are certainly finding out these days. And meanwhile, the existence of an international labor market is shifting the racial, religious, and linguistic compositions of many societies, particularly in Europe, to some extent here as well, a situation very few nations have handled in the past without significant social disruption, although our record in that regard certainly is better than that of any other nation. And even where immigration is not a major issue, integration tends to threaten those cherished peculiarities that define national character, however illogical these may be from a purely economic perspective. There is, after all, such a thing as preserving the right to eccentricity, the right, for example, to produce 300 varieties of cheese, as in France, or to cook badly, as in England. Uh, people do not easily part with these cherished eccentricities. The role of the state, let's face it, the role of the state has never been and is not simply that of facilitating the operation of the market. The role of the state is rather that of enhancing the overall well-being of its citizens, both from an economic and a non-economic perspective. And market systems alone, whatever their other virtues, and there, there are many, do not accomplish this. It follows that any government that defines its responsibilities solely, or even primarily, in economic terms is apt to find its political base increasingly fragile. People do not normally vote the way economists think. It should be no surprise then, in the light of that principle, that the Maastricht Treaty met with a less than enthusiastic reception uh, within the European community, or that the North American Free Trade Agreement did not prove easy to sell in the United States. Now, whatever the merits of these agreements, and again, they are many, I think it's very important for us to recognize that the questions they have raised are not going to go away. They are not likely to follow uh, the giant sucking noise made by the now diminished reputation of Ross Perot. Uh, and even Perot, we should remember, resembles the ever ready battery bunny in more than one way. <laughs> I think issues raised uh, uh, by such uh, episodes as Maastricht and NAFTA are going to get more serious, not less serious, with the passage of time, especially as economic integration is extended more widely to parts of the world where the problem of disproportionate benefits that I'm talking about here uh, could become even greater. All of which is only to make a rather simple point, that the closer one comes to a literal application of the principle of economic integration, just as is the case with the principle of political self-determination, the nearer one gets to an unworkable situation in which the authority of the state itself, as we have known it, is undermined. 
legitimacy rests, after all, upon the willingness of citizens to entrust states with the responsibility for safeguarding and advancing their own interests. Regimes that fail to perform that task sooner or later lose that legitimacy. That's what just happened to most of those that followed the Marxist-Leninist path. But oppression and incompetence are not the only conditions that can erode official authority. It can also be compromised if the standards we expect from states and from those who lead states are set too high. It is, of course, commonplace these days to deplore the absence of effective leadership. Nowhere in the post-Cold War world, it seems, uh, is there a politician who commands respect. But think about it. I mean, what is the likelihood that so many countries would have chosen ineffective leaders at just the same time? I mean, the statistical odds alone make such a triumph of mediocrity seem most improbable. <laughs> the real crisis of leadership today, I suspect, may well result, at least in part, from our current habit of expecting political self-determination and economic integration at the same time. In our euphoria over how the Cold War ended, we may have established standards that no state, no coalition of states, can really hope to achieve. It would hardly be surprising under such circumstances that the reputations of all states and of all leaders of the states would suffer as a result. Now, some people might see this as a good thing. Now, there is a tendency, especially in intellectual and academic circles, to distrust all power. Governments and governors are, by definition, power's most visible repositories. They are by no means the only possible repositories of power, though. And indeed, you're all familiar with the case that's being made increasingly these days, that power is shifting from states to transnational interest groups, whether of a corporate or a professional or a social or, or even a religious character. Not even the survival of states as we, had, as we have known them should be taken for granted indefinitely. States are actually a fairly recent phenomenon in world history, only about 500 years or so. Uh, and there are a lot of other phenomena, there are a lot of other institutions that have lasted for a much longer uh, period of time. But it is difficult to know right now just what we would replace states with if the need to do so should ever arise. Because after all, the other centers of power, the alternative centers of power that are developing these days, for the most part, lack the mechanisms of accountability that most democratic states have evolved over time. After all, who really controls the multinational corporations? or the international currency markets, or the various religious movements whose international influence is rapidly growing. I mean, it would seem to me imprudent to allow challenges to state authority, whether from the integration of the marketplace or from the fragmentation of defunct empires, to proceed too far. And yet, it seems to me that's also the direction in which, uh, toward which our current literal mindedness with regard to these principles of economic integration and political self-determination are pointing us. This literal mindedness, as I suggested, is in part an artifact of uh, the Cold War and how easily it ended. And what may be happening now is the, uh, that the particular conditions that for a time favored both economic integration and political self-determination are simply passing from the scene. And our intellectual habits have yet to catch up, have yet to accommodate themselves to this development. But another reason for our present literal mindedness with regard to this may have to do, I think, with the extent to which we have got into the habit of compartmentalizing categories in our own minds. I mean, how many people who have been enthusiastic about the application of self-determination in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union have really sat down to think through what the economic prospects of these new states are going to be? How many of those who worked over the years for economic integration have considered what the domestic political reaction to that process uh, was going to be? It is a very rare leader, indeed, these days, who is capable of thinking simultaneously about economics and politics. And yet, in the real world, as we all know, these two subjects overlap, coexist, and interact with one another all the time. One of the reasons that Western strategy worked during the early days of the Cold War was precisely the fact that it was not compartmentalized. The founders of the Marshall Plan, NATO, and the European community were able to think creatively about the interconnections of politics, economics, and Cold War strategy. One of the reasons the Soviet Union lost the Cold War was that the thinking of its leaders became excessively monodimensional. 
focusing too narrowly on military considerations at the expense of everything else. But think about it, how well are we doing today in thinking ahead multi-dimensionally? And even more important, how well are we training the coming generation to do so? I think the trends are not particularly encouraging. So where do we go from here? How do we devise strategies for coping with the post-Cold War world? Well, I think we should, uh, first of all, not be shy about asking what might seem at first to be naive questions. What precisely do we gain? by pushing simultaneously or even separately for economic integration and political self-determination. If the answer to that question turns out to be an ideological answer, that these things are inherently good in themselves uh, and that no further benefits need be specified, then that ought to be a little yellow flag, that pontification, but not thought, has taken place. Truly praiseworthy concepts do not require ideologies in order to justify them. Second, I think we need to give greater attention to the interrelationships that exist among phenomena. Life and politics, unfortunately, do not organize themselves in the way that universities, think tanks, and government agencies tend to. Unless we can change the way that we train people to think, unless we can make them see that the real world is indeed multifaceted and therefore multidisciplinary, then we're hardly likely to prepare them adequately for the complexities they're going to have to think about. Third, I think we need to revive the art of thinking in contingent and not absolute terms. We've got to recognize that history has not ended, which means that principles are going to have to be compromised as they have always been in the past. Ideologies most often fail, not because they have adjusted their principles to fit reality, but because they have attempted to turn those principles without adjustment into official policy. We need to be very careful not to make the mistake of transform transforming good ideas like economic integration and political self-determination into inflexible dogmas, however politically correct it may appear to be to do so. Fourth, we need to recognize that although authoritarian empires have collapsed, the need for some authority still remains in the world. Neither prosperity nor democracy are going to flourish under conditions of anarchy, and we badly need to find some new center of authority, whether at the national or the international level, that can at least approximate some of the order the old Cold War system, for all of its faults, did in fact provide. And finally, and related to the above, we need to determine whether the post-Cold War world is mature enough to construct a generally accepted framework of order without having to have some hegemon impose it. Europeans invited the United States to play that hegemonic role after both of the great world wars of this century. And obviously the United States did so with far greater skill, imagination, and success following the second of those wars than it did after the first. Today, in the wake of the debacle over Bosnia and the muddle over Maastricht, uh, in a way, a third invitation is being extended to the Americans to lead once again. But there are few signs as yet that Washington has got either the will or the necessary wisdom uh, to, uh, to accept that invitation. I, the more I think about it, am inclined to think that may not be a totally bad thing. Indeed, I wonder if one of the more creative uses of our present adversity might not be to find an acceptable multilateral alternative to this habit that the rest of the world has developed in the 20th century of always looking to the United States uh, for leadership that we are only sporadically, it seems to me, equipped to provide. The end of the Cold War presents us then with an unprecedented opportunity to build a new kind of international order, free of great power wars, hot and cold, from which we should be able to approach more closely than ever before the ancient goals of justice, prosperity, and liberty. We won't construct that world, though, by insisting on perfectionism. The conduct of statecraft is always going to involve the compromising of principles, something that the most skillful practitioners of statecraft have known all along. And if we insist on treating each of those compromises as cynicism, if we prefer ideological purity at the expense of practical accomplishment, then I think we're sure to undermine whatever legitimacy uh, the new international order has attained uh, by overcommitting it 
before it is even fully in place. Millennial thinking, ladies and gentlemen, is the last thing we need now that the millennium is finally upon us. Thank you very much.